Hello everyone, uh, uh, this is uh, our next uh, Industry Talks podcast, this time in a little bit different format. We are recording in English, we are recording here in uh, Budapest and we have an honor to have with us James P. Womack. He is uh, a former uh, president of Lean Enterprise Institute. Hello Mr. Womack. Hello. Uh, it's really uh, good to have you here and thank you for uh, taking the time. This morning we have listened to your talk on uh, Lean and how the Lean was named. And you mentioned the Fragile. Um, that this name was like in, in conversation about Lean. Uh, what did you mean when you mentioned that there was a fragile and it was connected with people? Mm -hmm. And how does this now connect to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to Lean management? There have been many people with many points of view <clears throat> who have uh, been interested in these ideas. Mm -hmm. And some of them are traditional production managers some are product development people, okay. some are purchasing people, supplier improvement alignment people. And uh, in uh, the history of Lean, uh, the HR people were actually quite important. Okay. If you go to Toyota in Japan, you say, what's the most important department? And they will say, oh, it's HR. You say, really? This is a manufacturing company. And they say, yes, we have a plan for every person. Mm -hmm. HR develops that plan for every person. And that's very important for us because our expectation is that everyone who comes into the company will stay in the company for life. It's not a legal requirement. Okay. It's not like they've signed a contract, but that is our expectation. So people come at the age of 18, people come at the age of 22, when they get out of higher school or when they get out of university. And so we have a plan for them. And the reason this is a fragile system is because it depends on everyone, mm -hmm. everyone trying to do the work and trying to improve the work. Okay. And you can sort of force people to do the work, but it's a lot harder to force people to improve the work. And people agree to improve the work if they believe this is a fair arrangement. Okay, And the minute they stop believing that, they're not going to make any suggestions. They're not going to uh, come up with any ideas. They're going to say, this organization doesn't support us. Why should we support them? So that's the fragile part. Okay. That if you lose the social contract, what they call a mutual obligation, employee is obligated to the company to defend their job. The company is employed to... Uh, uh, obligated to the employee to improve their skills so they can defend their job. So that's how you get an arrangement that can be, wait a minute, when it's working properly, it's very robust and strong. But as it begins to fall apart, it becomes very fragile. So that's uh, where that idea came from. But then you didn't decide for fragile, you decided for lean. And uh, most of people uh, consider when we talk about lean, we talk about less, less mm -hmm. inventory, mm -hmm. less uh, capital, mm -hmm. less everything. Uh, was that it? Does it really mean less everything or there's some, something mm -hmm. more behind it? Well, uh, consistent with the obligation to people, mm -hmm. uh, lean enterprises really need to grow mm -hmm. because they're trying to keep their people. And they need to increase the amount of value they're creating to in a, in a world where there's a lot of open competition. Mm -hmm. They need to be uh, doing better all the time. So therefore, um, you do have a, a, a need mm -hmm. uh, for every person uh, to do better and to engage them in doing better and to give them uh, the knowledge and information they need. Um, and that means creating more value. Here's a, a, a package of value okay. for the customer. And only customers define value. We would like to provide that value with less and less effort mm -hmm. and capital investment and lead time and so forth and waste and so forth. But if we do that, uh, we can defend the jobs of the people because the people are going to become steadily more productive. That doesn't mean working faster, working harder. It means uh, less waste and more value. 
So that's why it uh, it can work, but it does require uh, a commitment. Okay. Uh, one of the things that's happened around the world over the last 20 or 25 years when we've had lots of open trade mm -hmm. uh, is that managers everywhere have tried to figure out how to uh, get people who will work for less by going to all kinds of faraway countries, but also people uh, in a relatively open world say, gosh, I think I'll go somewhere else where I can do better. Yep. Uh, so therefore, you go to Germany. Uh, let's suppose you're a Croatian manufacturing company. Your employees keep wanting to go to Germany. And then you're tempted, well, okay, let's produce, let's get our product from some very poor country with very mm -hmm. cheap labor. So this is all a problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm not against people uh, going to Germany to seek their fortune. But it is a bad situation when people feel that's their only choice. Yep. So if we have good manufacturing with good management, we can probably change that. Um, now you touched the, uh, the one of the questions that I have prepared. Uh, good you mentioned good management. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have a good management in Link Company? How mm -hmm. would you mm -hmm. uh, describe a good management mm -hmm. of, of a Link Company? Well, one way to describe it is the levels of management. That where many companies have failed to actually sustain lean thinking, lean methods, is that they don't create what we call basic stability. And that means every day, everything works. Okay. And the way you create and sustain basic stability is through daily management. Okay, daily management. So just imagine uh, the morning starts and the frontline team that's doing the actual work uh, is asked, um, did anything go wrong yesterday? Did we do less well yesterday than we've been doing? Something happened. What was it? How can we make sure it doesn't go wrong today? So that's daily management. That's the 7 a.m. team meeting if okay. you're in the factory. And then uh, it turns out that uh, people who have problem-solving skills in a lean enterprise, we want everyone to have problem-solving skills, can often deal with the problem right there. Okay. The reason we had a problem was because of this, and so we're going to change this so we won't have that problem. But sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm. And then, as we say, we pull the end on cord. But what that does is escalate the problem to the next level, so here you have the frontline workers and the team leader. Now we're talking about the first uh, level of direct uh, management. And then maybe they can solve the problem at that level, and maybe they can't. And so, for example, in Toyota, all over the world, uh, they start at 7 in the morning with the team meeting. And then the team meeting leads to the group meeting, which leads to the area meeting, which leads to the general meeting. And by you get to, let's say, 9 o'clock in the morning, well, the general manager knows here are the problems that no one could solve at a lower level. Okay. As Toyota says, every problem has its correct level for solution. Every problem. Many problems can be solved here. Now, lots of companies that decided to delegate problem solving to the operational excellence team okay. or the quality team or the industrial engineering team or whatever, in fact, can't solve problems at that front line because the workers don't have any skills. Okay. They don't know how to do this. They, all they know is if something goes wrong, you pull the cord, and eventually somebody comes, comes and inside. does something, maybe. Okay. Okay? So therefore, we want to create uh, an enterprise where everybody can sustain their work, get it right every time, and everyone can improve their work by periodically doing improvement. And then at the very top, uh, the most important thing about uh, good management is that there's a way to get agreement on the few things that are really important. And in the Toyota world, they call that Hoshin planning, Hoshin planning, where there are just a couple of big issues that really are important to the company. And those issues all go across the company. This is not something in one department. These are big issues. And you need a method. Uh, called Hoshin planning, to deselect the things that aren't important. There are lots of things people could work on. You can't fix all of them. Most of them are actually, for the short term, anyway, not important. Mm -hmm. There are a few big things. 
Uh, for example, just recently at Toyota, I've actually observed this myself, um, they need to do a lot of experiments with autonomy, mm -hmm. with electrification, with asset sharing, in other words, vehicles that are shared by, this is the Uber and Lyft okay. and that kind yeah. of thing, yeah. uh, with connectivity, where there's okay. a lot more data going into vehicles, a lot more data going out. Maybe you can make money with that data, maybe you can't. Maybe you can diagnose problems early and so forth. But and nevertheless, color, it also the, makes problems. These are all things that Toyota has never had to worry about. Mm -hmm. Toyota worried about how to design a car, how to make a car, and how to maintain a car once in customer hands. That's what they did. That's what car companies do. So now suddenly, uh, Toyota needs to do these other things. And the only way to do it is to try some experiments. Mm -hmm. So for their big Hoshin objective of two years ago, they said uh, we need to raise the money from internal operations to try the experiments. Okay. We need, because we don't want to borrow, we've learned in the past borrowing is bad, and we don't want to sell more stock. We've learned what happens when outsiders get control of the company. So therefore, with our own means, and that means we have to improve lots of activities and take waste out, which produces cash, which then permits them to do these things they need to do. So that's, in our view, good management is multi-level, mm -hmm. frontline daily management, higher level, uh, problem solving, but also some improvement activities, and then top level, what's important. Okay. So, uh, in this sense, good management, uh, it, it seems like there are some uh, KPIs that uh, you follow when, uh, when you, uh, for example, start uh, lean improvement initiatives, mm -hmm. and when you drive those uh, improvement initiatives. Mm -hmm. Like in car, you have velocity on your dashboard, mm -hmm. or you have a uh, motor temperature. Right. Uh, what would be, from your, your experience, what would be those KPIs that companies should look at mm -hmm. at the very beginning mm -hmm. so they know that they're, they're driving in the mm -hmm. right direction? Mm -hmm. So starting maybe from, uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from the general management and then mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. moving it uh, well, uh, down. It's very simple. What's your problem? Okay. Maybe your company has a quality problem. Mm -hmm. People are not buying the product because it doesn't work very well. Maybe your company has a lead time problem. Mm -hmm that you could do it, but somebody else gets there before you. Mm -hmm. Maybe your company has a cost problem, okay? Maybe uh, your company has the sort of problem I just described that what people think is value has changed. Okay. People just wanted to buy a car. Well, now, now they want to buy an electric mm -hmm. shared autonomous car. Those are not things that any car had uh, not very long ago, right? So what's your problem? That's the key thing. And by the way, that's what the Hoshin plan is really about. What are our big problems? Okay. So if you don't know what your problem is, how do you know what to do? And certainly, how do you know whether you've solved it? Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So you then get back to KPIs. Um, and KPIs are really uh, the contribution of what we call modern management. These are the big companies like Volkswagen and General Motors and General Electric and so mm -hmm. forth, in which each manager has an area. And for their area, they have some KPIs, inventory turns, dollars of revenue per employee, and so forth, okay? But uh, for the lean world, uh, that's a real problem because the higher level manager judges the lower level manager by saying, did you make your numbers? Mm -hmm. A very dangerous thing to say. And so the lean manager uh, says, all right, we've had a discussion. Uh, we've had our Hoshin plan. Here is how you need to improve. Please tell me, junior manager, please tell me as your senior manager, A, how are you going to do this? And B, how do I need help? Don't just come back at the end of the quarter or the end of the year and say, ah, I did it. Because what experience shows is the easiest way to improve a KPI here is to hurt a KPI over here. And in many companies, you know, the standard way you hold yourself is that everything is somebody else's problem and you don't get anywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. And so it's not an effective way to manage. So what's the problem? What are you going to do to solve the problem? How can I help? Those are the three questions that every manager needs to be able to ask the manager below them. And by the way, all companies have levels. 
Mm -hmm. We've all kind of dreamed of a world where, you know, there is no hierarchy. Um, I, I don't expect we'll ever find that. Uh, there are some levels. And at each level, uh, instead of giving orders and say, do that, do this, do this, instead they say, okay, here's the problem. Here's the gap that we're trying to close. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? How can I help? That's a different conversation than make your numbers. I'll see you at the end of the quarter. And so often, uh, your compensation is tied to making your numbers. Well, now you're really creating a toxic uh, environment uh, in which people start to do very mean things to each other, each trying to make their own personal goal. Numbers. And that's very bad. We shouldn't do that. And uh, you, you now mentioned uh, uh, several very important things for, mm -hmm. for good management. One of those is daily management mm -hmm. and um, how you approach. If you want to measure something, you first have to know what is the problem and then mm -hmm. uh, put some kind of uh, metrics on it so, mm -hmm. so you know mm -hmm. if it's uh, going uh, well. But then you also mentioned uh, uh, learning, mm -hmm. the, 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 the importance of learning. Mm -hmm. So I know that for new, new companies, startups, in the first place, learning is crucial. Learning about what, who is, who is the customer, what, what's the customer's problem, uh, do they need this solution, etc. But for the company that has more continuous innovation, uh, what kind of learning should we look at uh, from the lower level to the upper level? One of the problems that a lot of companies have is that the line managers actually don't understand the value creating process. Okay. They don't know. They've got a scoreboard, a dashboard like that, but when everything is read, they really don't know why. Mm -hmm. And that's why in a lean enterprise, uh, we in general believe in promoting from below. Okay. We believe that every worker, wherever they are, should understand the process. Otherwise, they're just guessing. And every worker needs to know how to do PDCA, problem solve. Mm -hmm. And that's science. You've got a hypothesis about what the issue is. You're going to try an experiment. That's the D. So the hypothesis is the P, the plan. The experiment is the D. You need to check. That's the C, to see what happened. Yeah. And by the way, you have to agree on what the check is before you start our people will change what success is. Okay. We'll on the find way. a way to change it. Okay, And then uh, it's a very rare case where any experiment is completely successful. That's rare in life, actually. We think every manager should be able to succeed every time. That's an interesting idea, but wait a minute. Just think about your own experience. No, that's not what happens. Okay. So you've got a definition of the problem. You've got a countermeasure that you're going to put in place as an experiment. You're going to check to see what happens. And then you're going to say, hmm, we didn't completely solve the problem. Now we need to adjust. We need to think of a, a modification, something else we need to do or whatever. So it's this loop that goes round and round. And every manager uh, should participate in that. But how can you participate when you don't even know how it works? I, uh, the MBAs are the worst, people who got uh, business degrees in the American standard, and they all uh, manage by objectives. Mm -hmm. You're given some numbers, and um, you're just trying to get through the quarter and through the year, do whatever. And I've walked with many of those managers through the activity they're managing, and I say, gee, tell me how this works. I say, well, we've got experts who know about that. Really, do you? Where are they? Well, they're over in the whatever. I see. They're not here right now. No. Okay. So how do you think it works? And then it turns out they can't tell you. I had a wonderful case uh, not long ago with a company that was turning on their ERP system that had an MRP a module inside. So that's material requirements planning inside an energy resource planning. Mm -hmm. This was Oracle. Could have been SAP, yeah, whatever. Any other. And they turned it on, and guess what? They lose visibility on orders and on parts. Okay? So I happened to be there that day and went to the meeting. Now this is a top-level problem. 
with the head of the company and all of the department heads. And I just sat in the back. And it became very embarrassing. And finally, after a while, I just had to get up and leave. It turned out there was not a single person, including the head of IT, who actually understood the logic driving the ERP, the MRP inside the ERP. So they were going to take action mm -hmm. to fix this. Nobody knows what the problem is. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, these poor guys. I, I just, this is so bad, I just got to get up and leave. It's so awkward for me to be here when these very highly paid, very smart, MBA, quick study people have no idea what the problem is. So I just got up and went out and shut the door and walked away. And I was just there to be an observer yeah, for sure. something totally different when this happened to happen. But I was really struck by how you could have very smart people. They would mm -hmm. do very well on a test uh, with lots of education. They were highly educated. No knowledge of how things actually worked. And the feeling, the honest belief that they could fix a problem that they didn't understand. So then they're having a big, however, shouting match over what the right thing to do is. And who wins there is just whatever the most powerful person is. Okay. We will do, you know, whatever the, uh, the big gorilla says we should do. No way to run a company. Okay, and, and, and in these situations, normally in companies, is this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we spark then uh, the, the, the right kind of improvements in this kind of uh, environment? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. those companies might have good products, mm -hmm. they might have really great people, mm -hmm. but just because of the wrong approach, they are not mm -hmm. succeeding on mm -hmm. the market. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you have to actually change uh, how you behave. <laughs> you okay. can't just talk about it. You have to say, well, you, Mr. Manager, this is your area. Please go take some time to understand your process. And be honest. You don't understand. You're going to have to talk with a lot of people about what's really happening here. And by the way, the people down below may not tell you the truth mm -hmm. because what life has taught them is always cover up problems because problems you're blamed for. So you go out and you take a look, and they say, oh, everything's doing fine here. I say, really? Uh, well, then what's happening here? Oh, well, this is not normal. This just happened this morning. It's, it's not normal. I say, oh, really? OK. Well, if I come back tomorrow, well, then this won't be happening. Uh, well, not tomorrow. We've got another situation, but maybe next week. Mm -hmm. Well, that tells you right there. Come on. This is what's normal. I always uh, say that I am a probability warp. That whenever I take a company, walk in a company, there are all of these abnormal things happening. And so I say, well, I, I can see the solution, and that's to get me out of here. That's right. Because apparently when I'm not here, none of these bad things happen. Yeah. So I should just leave. And I say, uh, you're making a joke, aren't okay. you? I say, well, yes, but it's true. So. So um, it's important that then uh, managers uh, go and understand understand the principles. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there is this concept of uh, of Gemba Walk that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you were mentioning yeah. about. Is there uh, some uh, specific steps uh, that you take mm -hmm. when you start with Gemba Walk mm -hmm. practices? Mm -hmm. um, not when you are like uh, used to do the Gemba Walks, but mm -hmm. at the very beginning, mm -hmm. what should those people that still are, still are not aware of Gemba mm -hmm. Walks? Mm -hmm. It would be their mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. How should I approach this Gamba walk? Yeah. Well, let me take an example from yesterday. Mm -hmm. I went to a company that makes something. It's a manufacturing company. I have no idea how it works. I don't understand the technology. <clears throat> but I said, why don't we start with the customer, the customer end, and tell me how the schedule is developed, the production schedule. I said, well, that's done in scheduling. I say, OK, could we get someone from scheduling? OK, well, find some schedule. I say, so how is the schedule developed? Well, it turns out that's quite an interesting discussion because the schedule is not developed in relation to what the manufacturing can actually do, but not what the customer wants, but what the sales program calls for. Okay. And this was a company that does a lot of promotions, mm -hmm. a lot of discount and so forth. So they are themselves <laughs> doing causing the, variation uh, in the schedule. It turned out that customer demand is actually very smooth, but they managed to do that. And wait a minute, from the standpoint of sales, operations uh, should change how they do things so they can deal with crazy variation. Okay, and of course, I'm the lean guy. I'm trying to look at the whole thing. 
They said, well, now, wait a minute. What's the right thing for the customer and the company? By the way, great question to ask. What's the right thing for the customer? And what's the right thing for the company? Not what's the right thing for sales mm -hmm. or what's the right thing for, for production. Customer. Because each of you, when I say that, uh, says, okay, we should have one SKU with no variation mm -hmm. forever. That's what operation says. And sales says, no, no, we need a new SKU for each customer and we need to be able to introduce it instantly. Mm -hmm. So, well, no, wait a minute. One SKU forever, a new SKU for every customer. This can't possibly, you yeah, can't live work. together. So what are we gonna do? Well, maybe we should ask the customer what they really want rather than what you say they want. So that's the beginning of the gimbal walk is always to start with the customer, mm -hmm. go backwards and say, well, now what are your problems? Now. When I do that, and I've been doing this for 40 years, uh, I'm almost always looking at something that I do not myself understand. And that's actually good. And so my job is to say, well, now, wait a minute. What's the problem here? Well, wait a minute. You're not agreeing on what the problem is. Could we discuss why you're not agreeing on what the problem is? Now, oddly, I'm the guy who can ask that question. When the company has agreed, this department, this department, we don't talk about this, okay? We just mess about with it. So um, I don't know anything. That's very important uh, for me not to have the answer, but I can help people figure out the question. So is, is it the person then, uh, for example, the, the CEO going to the mm -hmm. shop floor, mm -hmm. uh, should he just ask the questions? Mm -hmm. like, like you, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and not trying to come up with the answers? Well, what uh, CEOs feel comfortable doing is giving answers. Yeah, sure. Typically an answer that some consultant has suggested to them that they don't understand, but that was a very expensive, fancy consultant, and that consultant said everybody else is that. doing this, so we should do this. That's terrible. Okay. That's worse than worthless. Um, so as a, as a matter of my practice, I'm sort of standing in for the CEO who really doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And often I have that person come with me. And they, oh boy, they want to give the answer. They really do. The whole idea here is that because you're up here and you've had lots of experience and you've had lots of education, you must know what to do. But reality doesn't care mm -hmm. who you are, where you came from, how much experience. Reality is just asking, what's the problem now? And in logic, what could be done about it? So what's really interesting is to ask people who've never been asked, what's the problem? Say, so tell me about the problem. And then it turns out they really can't describe the problem. So there's the problem. You can't tell me what the problem is. So how can you deal with that? And how can the higher levels of management help with that? Well, now it's a completely different discussion. Uh, so yesterday, I was looking at um, a company that uh, does not do promotion, uh, that's, and it has a pretty stable demand, but they have eight months of finished unit inventory because they sell all over the world, mm -hmm. and there are lots of reasons why they would have eight months of finished unit inventory. Meanwhile, over in the factory, they're trying to figure out how to shorten lead time from five days to one. Okay, that's good, but they shorten lead time in the factory from five days one to support an inventory stream that runs out for eight months. Said, so what's the problem here? <laughs> is the problem lead time in the factory or is the problem that you're completely divorced from your customer? But this goes through levels of distribution. Okay. Okay, so what, what do you think the problem here is? And we started the day where well, they're thinking the problem's the factory. And by the time I left, they said, hmm, we've never actually thought about this that way. They said, oh, good, I'm glad. Um, so uh, I think you should think about this. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. By the way, this is a, pro a product with a shelf life. Okay. And their science people have been working on how to extend the shelf life. So right now it's two years. They were trying to figure out how to make it a four-year product that would last on the shelf. And it, and so I and said, you know, here's an idea, just an idea. Why don't you figure out how you can shut shelf life in half so that instead of going from two years to four, go from two years to one? So we'd well, never go backward with shelf life. And I said, if you did, you would have to deal with this problem. 
And by the way, when you get to one year, cut it to six months, and they say, whoa, wait a minute, We've, we're gonna lose a third of our product because it's obsolete, it's past uh, sell-by date. So that would be really good for you. Well, this was totally backwards from the way they've been thinking. Now, look, I could be wrong, and I meant it as a little bit of a joke, but still, uh, they were taking a bad problem and trying to figure out how to make it worse mm -hmm. so they could have even more inventory. Uh, by the way, aside on inventory, that we've been living in a world of very cheap money all over the world for the last 15 years. And I think we're now moving to a world where money costs money. It gives you a very different mindset. Uh, the reason Toyota way back when, in 1950s, was so intent on shortening lead time and reducing inventory was because in, uh, money was very expensive in Japan after the war, mm -hmm. and they didn't have any money. And so they were desperately trying to put velocity into the system to, as an alternative to having to borrow. Okay. Okay? So I think that may be a world that we're coming back to. I think that would be a good thing for the world myself. If money were expensive rather than cheap, it's like you reduce the sell-by date from four years to two. Forces you to really think about all the waste in the system, which uh, we've had a little bit of a... Uh, you know, sort of, uh, that's been forgiven uh, for the last some years. Okay, uh, and now that we, we, we touch the, the inventory uh, mm -hmm. or WIP, mm -hmm. um, and um, you mentioned in one of your talks that uh, you don't touch uh, VIP until you touched uh, the variation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. could you a little bit elaborate on that right. and uh, how is that to connect that's it? Right. Well, in the early days when people talked about JIT, mm -hmm. just in time, they thought that meant a zero inventory system. Okay. There's even a fellow who wrote a book, a wonderful guy, uh, called Zero Inventory was the name mm -hmm. of the book. This was 30 years ago. Just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, in the lean world, but let's say the Toyota world that I come out of, at every point in a production process, they know what the standard inventory is. Now, what do I mean by standard inventory? Well, there is a safety stock up here to protect the customer in the downstream process from incapability uh -huh. here. There's also a buffer stock here, which is to protect the upstream guys from variation here. That's where Hijunka comes in. Uh -huh. And there's also a shipping stock that maybe you just ship once a day or once a week or whatever. Well, then on average, you're going to have at least a half day of shipping stock or a half week of shipping stock. No defense. And you put those together, buffer stock, safety stock, shipping stock. In the Toyota world, that's called standard inventory. Mm -hmm. And given your capability, if you're not going to improve your capability, and given your variability in demand, if you're not going to deal with that, you must have this amount of inventory to protect the customer. Okay. So now, if you want to reduce the amount of inventory, well, wait a minute, start with demand. That's where Hijunka comes in, leveling. So let's take all of that twitching mm -hmm. out of demand and level it. And then up here, let's improve the capability of the process so that it actually produces a good result every time. Well, then you can have less safety stock, less buffer stock, and then, by the way, why don't we ship more frequently? Generally, mm -hmm. that's good. So then our total standard inventory falls. But wait a minute. If you try to reduce the inventory without improving capability or reducing variability, best of luck, uh, all that's going to happen is that you have out of stocks and mad customers, right? Okay. And there have been a lot of managers who uh, got with the JIT thing and said, well, I'll just uh, produce a decree Okay. that we need to reduce inventory by 20%. So practically, uh, inventory hides also the, the wastes, mm -hmm. uh, as, yeah. as, as I noticed, yeah. because if there is a variation, mm -hmm. so there is a waste. Right. That's right. Uh, and uh, in, that's in right. quality, for example. And so and that's so. why uh, Toyota has always wanted to uh, reduce inventory. But wait a minute. Uh, first, <laughs> you improve capability okay. and reduce variability. Or else you're just going to, you know, they, they always said we want to lower the water so we can see the rocks. Okay. 
But wait a minute, we don't want to sink the ship. Yeah. That's a heroic thing to say. But in real life, wait a minute. Uh, we say in the next year, we're going to find a way to improve capability mm -hmm. and decrease variability so that in this year, we'll steadily reduce the standard inventory. But that's not in front of improving capability and reducing variability, mm -hmm. that's just after. Yeah. Okay. So that's where people get confused. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a mistake. Okay. Uh I, I remember what you said that you're a lucky man when, when you go in a company and then uh, there are some uh, extreme situations happening. I, I just recently also visited one company and mm -hmm. then the same situation happened to me and then mm -hmm. I explained this to mm -hmm. the management mm -hmm. and I said, no, this is mm -hmm. just that time. Mm -hmm. And I came after a few days and the same situation happened and I'm very lucky. Yeah. I should maybe yeah. consider a different profession. But yeah. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I would like to maybe go um, to the to the end of this conversation uh, with, with several questions regarding the, the what has changed with lean in in the last mm -hmm. 30 30 mm -hmm. 26 30 years yeah. um, there were there were some principles that were defined at the very beginning mm -hmm. in, in your lean thinking book mm -hmm. uh, has something changed with those principles no I think that in, uh, I think what has changed is that we have um, moved from a method of teaching mm -hmm. that is more about teaching people to learn rather than teaching people the answer. That when Americans first encountered the lean ideas, which was really in the 1970s, they learned it from people who, Japanese people, who had left Toyota after they had been part of the big campaign at the end of the 1960s to bring the 300 suppliers up to the level of Toyota. Mm -hmm. During the 50s and 60s, Toyota had learned an enormous amount about stability and capability, but suppliers hadn't really kept up. So at the end of the 60s, they began to grow very rapidly. That's when they had the Corolla, mm -hmm. which was the first really competitive product all over the world. So suddenly, they need to grow, and suppliers said, well, we'll need a fortune in capital expenditure to keep up, and Toyota said, no, 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 we will come and help you fix your process. Mm -hmm. So these were the people who had worked for Taichi Ono, worked for Mr. Suzumura, who was his deputy, and they went to companies, and they did Kaizen to companies. Okay. They walked in. Okay, this. everybody stand back. We're going to go from batch and queue to continuous flow. We're going to move all the machines. We're going to do it overnight. It was very much uh, like a war. Okay. And these people, by the way, were uh, gentlemen who had been involved in the Pacific War, mm -hmm. who were used to war. Okay. And it didn't seem so strange to them to just throw the doors open and say to the supplier, everything's going to change right now. But then, wait a minute, uh, that was done in Japan fairly quickly, and so by the 70s, those people said, whoa, um, we really don't have a career path inside the Japanese companies, let's go to Europe and America, and basically do to them what we did to the Japanese suppliers. So therefore, the attitude and the tone was very much, we will tell you, we'll tell you what your problem is, we'll tell you what the solution is, We'll show you how to do it. We're going to do it right now. And then you can take care of all the details. And it never worked very well, okay? Because they paid no attention to management. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, physical transformation. Okay. And, and that's working when they were right. there. And they didn't really teach people. You can watch someone do a magic trick. That doesn't mean you can do a magic sure. trick. Okay? okay, and they really kind of assumed that. Uh, I'm going to do a magic trick, you watch me, and then you can do a magic trick. So it didn't work very well. So as time went on, uh, people realized, and that's both Japanese, uh, but also Americans, Europeans, that uh, you actually have to coach people on how to solve problems rather than tell them the answer. And you certainly, they have to do it. And you can stand and watch, but you're not going to do it, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big change. And it's one that uh, American European senior management uh, really were of an older generation who really were kind of comfortable with now hear this, 
you shout down the speaking tube from the bridge, you know, full speed ahead, and uh, you know, do whatever. But they didn't know what to do. Okay. So that's the big change, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we've gone from uh, solving the problem for you to teaching you how to figure out what the problem is and then figure out what the countermeasures are and how to do effective PDCA. Mm -hmm. Second thing that's happened is that people have realized that you can't just avoid the management issues, mm -hmm. that those Japanese consultants were not managers. They were basically project people who were in the problem-solving department. And they would go out and uh, they always produced something called the Kaizen newspaper at the end of the Kaizen week. And it was all of these things that had to do with changing how the management system worked, none of which ever got done. Because okay. they weren't interested. They said, oh yeah, and do that, and do that, and do that. So then people realized, wait a minute, um, we have to actually earlier, not later, think about management. And that's where we get back to this daily management, improvement management, and what we would call big move the needle management. That's mm -hmm. Hoshin, that's Kaizen, this is daily management. And what they observed pretty quickly was that people were calling Kaizen what was really just rework. They fixed a process, they couldn't sustain it, goes back down here, so now they're gonna do some Kaizen, they get back up here, it goes down here, because the management system can't support it, but okay. we're gonna call that improvement. Well, actually, there's no improvement <clears throat> from right here, and so that's the sawtooth pattern that you would see. And by the way, generation after generation of consultant would come through, do the same experiments. I was at a company here in uh, Budapest uh, this week where I've been uh, involved in a conference, uh, which is repeating experiments that they tried 30 years ago and they could not sustain. It's really interesting. They didn't really know that. I know mm -hmm. the history. And this time, though, they really are thinking about management and how you have sustainable management. So that's those are the two things that happen. We've gone from uh, the great sensei solves problems mm -hmm. to the coach helps people learn how to solve problems and from the, oh, well, you figure out the management part, we're out of here, to, okay. wait a minute, let's start with the management part. And we need to take a little time and get this right. Um, you haven't asked, but let me just say that most big companies, and I don't know about uh, Croatia, mm -hmm. uh, across the world have set up operational excellence departments. Okay? Yeah, there are so many. And that's the old quality department plus some of the uh, industrial engineers. Yep. And uh, the attitude in those is still we solve problems. Toyota got beyond that 20 years ago. Said, you're fooling yourself. That you're going to go tell people what the problem is and tell people what the answer is. You're going to be very busy forever. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for the consultant, this is what we can call a moral hazard. Okay. You go in, you say, okay, here's your problem, here's your solution, go do it. And so it knows perfectly well they can't sustain it and that she or he will be back in a year. It's a wonderful business, okay? And I used to uh, observe, I've never been a consultant myself, but I observed consultants who told the company, if you do enough Kaizen, you will become a lean company. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we sell Kaizen weeks, which are very expensive, and you need to do more and more. And so I had a wonderful uh, experience in a company walking around with the chief executive who was wondering why they had gotten no sustainable results out of weekly Kaizen for decades. And he turned to me and he said, I finally realized that uh, Kaizen on top of chaos, which is no daily management, no stability, uh, just sinks to the bottom. The Kaizen is heavier than chaos, and so it's like oil and water. Uh, the water goes through and the oil goes up, but we never solve any problems. What could I do instead? So there's a general awareness that these big company operational excellence teams are trying to do the wrong thing. Okay. Rather than trying to coach people on how to identify problems, how to uh, countermeasure problems, they're solving problems. And so you call the fire department. 
you know, call the fire department, it's on fire again. No, 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 call the fire marshal. I don't know what that's, that's called yeah. uh, in Croatia, but this is the person who inspects the building in advance, says here are all your hazard points, we need to remove these hazards, mm -hmm. so you never need to call the fire department. Okay, well, there are a lot of firemen out there in the lean world who want to solve the problem. Uh, there are not so many fire marshals. And wait a minute, the fire marshal has to be the line management. Consultants can't, can't do that, okay. okay, because new problems are coming up all the time. That's what line managers are supposed to be doing. You don't need consultants for that. And yet we've had a world of lean consultants uh, who've probably not done as much good as they think, and I often think aren't doing any good at all. Are there any good clean consultants? Oh, I think there are. Um, the people that uh, my institute works with, they're not a consulting business. But a company calls and says, gee, we want to do something. I go take a walk, we take a look. They say, well, here are things you really need uh, to do. But actually, you don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And you don't know how to teach people to identify problems. You don't know how to teach people to countermeasure problems. Mm -hmm. I know some good ex-Toyota retired people, and they can help you. Okay. Uh, but by the way, we don't help. I mean, it's not anything my organization does. But here's some people. You can check it out. Um, so those people can actually do some good. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who are still in the old game of just trying to solve your current problems, um, I think you could spend your money uh, better in oh, some right. other way. Okay. So. Uh, this is, uh, this is a really good insight. Uh, I would just uh, ask uh, uh, one more question. Uh, it is regarding your talk today. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Tesla versus Toyota. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you also mentioned the company uh, Rivian mm -hmm. that you, you've been somehow yeah. Yeah. Uh, connected to. Uh, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> can you elaborate Uh, mm -hmm. what you said about the quality, Toyota and quality, you said that Toyota, uh, mm -hmm. not Toyota, the, the mm -hmm. Tesla is mm -hmm. always on all ranks, mm -hmm. uh, very yeah. low regarding yeah. the quality, yeah. Yeah. but the market val 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 valuation mm -hmm. uh, is like the, mm -hmm. the biggest uh, automotive company mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how these two connect yeah. and why, why, why so? Well, um, this is a classic case of technological disruption mm -hmm. uh, that Elon Musk uh, about 19, about 2008, had a fundamental realization uh -huh. that battery technology had changed. And by the way, he didn't change it. Okay. Battery technology had changed. A whole lot had been learned about lithium ion batteries, which had just much, much higher energy density than all the other batteries. Uh -huh. So he suddenly said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I can make an electric car that will have long range be very fast, whereas our image of electric cars like the old EV1 at General Motors, which was slow and short-ranged, I could make an exciting vehicle, long-range, and I can say this is the future. And what I'm really selling is the future. Okay. People who want to be part of the future. Okay. And who better than the people in Silicon Valley? who want to be, that's a whole culture built on the future. So I said, I can sell these cars to those people, even if they don't work that well, because these are early adopters, and that's what he's done. Mm -hmm. So his production process has always been quite erratic. It's gotten better, because he's got some old-fashioned car guys working for him now. Um, the product is, if you've driven it, is enormously exciting. Remember when I went out for the first time in a Tesla S and stepped on the pedal? You know, I said, whoa, I need one of these. I didn't get one of these, but I need one of these. But great, that's the early first mover. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now wait a minute. The game's not over. Uh, to hear Tesla tell it, the game's over. He won. Well, no, because the traditional car companies who had uh, what we call stranded assets, In other words, they've got all of these factories that build uh, internal combustion engines and transmissions and all these things you just don't need. It's very hard for them to just suddenly say, okay, we're going this other direction. So what they do instead is see, uh, does Tesla actually have any staying power? Okay? 
And now that's been answered. That uh, the companies like Toyota said, hey, these batteries are still not good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, cost is too high. Lots of operational problems. Uh, they're not that durable. They have an unfortunate tendency to catch fire and so forth. Let's wait. We'll wait for a while and see if the, uh, if the consumer is really uh, going to say this is the way. So now, just in the last uh, two years, all of the big car companies in the world have said, OK, we've decided this is going to happen. Because their approach is quite different from Tesla's, that they're selling. They're, they're not trying to sell to the early adopter. Mm -hmm. They're trying to sell to the middle of the market. Mm -hmm. And so they want a product that actually works and that doesn't feel that difficult to use. Uh, Toyota's just launching its first electric vehicle. They did, uh, 10 years ago, with Tesla, build about uh, 200 electric RAV4 vehicles mm -hmm. using the Tesla batteries and the Tesla motors. Okay. And they did that entirely to learn about where things stood. And what they concluded was, one, we could never work with Tesla because they don't have any of our interest in stability and in capability development. But second, it's premature. Uh, it's still too expensive. There's some real risk here. These things can blow up. Um, we need to work down the experience curve. They've been working very hard. Now they have a new vehicle, which is uh, the first of which is the BZ4X that I just happened to have bought one, and it will be delivered to me shortly. But the premise with the BZ4X is you take all the mystery out of electric vehicles. They are not selling to the Tesla buyer. And this is a mid-range uh, vehicle. But instead, if you read the write-ups, the people have gone out to review it, and they say, this thing seems so ordinary. You, just, you wouldn't know. It just doesn't have a gas motor. Well, that was their intent. And by the way, uh, the fit and the finish are great. Uh, we tested it for a while. It works. It doesn't break down. So now this is the counterattack from the old car guys who are actually pretty good at this point at, de uh, at delivering a product that actually works, mm -hmm. <laughs> has a reasonable price, that doesn't blow up. So now uh, I think within just the next year or two, uh, you're going to see Tesla saying, hmm, uh, there seems to be somebody in our rearview mirror because we've absolutely got the early adopter market. We got it. Yep. And those people will be loyal forever. And first they bought an S, and then they bought an X, and maybe for their kids they bought a 3 or a Y, and now they're going to buy a Cybertruck. Okay, we've always got those people, all those Silicon Valley people. But wait a minute, that's not the mass market. Uh, and these other guys who we've been very contemptuous, you know, they, uh, they're just totally dismissive. Uh, the Silicon Valley people. By the, by the way, if anybody who doesn't work in Silicon Valley, yeah. suddenly say, oh, wait a minute, uh, there's somebody in the rearview mirror. So the game's not over. And do I think that Tesla will fail in the end? I have no idea. Do I think that uh, Tesla will take over the whole car market? Well, I don't think so. You know, there are 100 million units of cars to be made in the world every year. And after 13 years of effort, Tesla this year will make about 1.5 million out of 100 million. That's a 1.5 market share. Yeah. Okay, well, just how long would it take one company, even if they could grow very fast, to have 50% of the market? Well, it's not going to happen. Okay, Tesla is not going to have 50% of the market. And uh, the old guys may stumble a bit, okay. but uh, they're going to play a better game than people have been thinking. By the way, these are companies that I've been terribly frustrated with, the Volkswagens and General yeah, sure. Motors of the world. I've had so many fights with, including with the top executives over the years about this Toyota nonsense. Well, guess what? They've copied most of it. They don't do it quite as well, but yeah, sure. all right. So that's, that's where we are. Now, my little uh, company, Rivian, is simply an accident that I had a student in my class at MIT uh, that over the years I've taught a seminar on the mobility system always okay. looking at what's new. And in 2009, a young man uh, walked in. Uh, his name is R.J. Scaringe, S-C-A-R-I-N-G-E, which I don't know what that is. I think it's German, but I don't know what it is. That's anyway, right. walks in and says, hi, I'm going to start a car company. Would you like to help me? And so that's how we got started. But I don't think it's a good idea for faculty to be in business with students. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, by the way, in engineering schools and technology schools, I'm the only person who believes that. I've had a relation with MIT for 48 years. All these MIT faculty are up to their necks with their students in new uh, innovative businesses. And that's fine, but I said, I'm not going there. But I said to this young man, here's the deal. I'll be your uncle, you be my nephew, okay? And sometimes you listen to your uncle, right? Sometimes you pay attention to your nephew, right? Sometimes sure. you don't, just depends. And this is not a financial deal. And I really enjoy talking about this. I'm not gonna put a lot of time in on it, um, but we've been talking for 13 years about what do I do next? What do we do now? And it's been a great uh, relationship. And uh, when the car was launched, I said you should get me one of the very first because I'm not gonna say anything bad about it, okay? There's some other people like journalists, you really don't want them to have the car because no telling what they might say. Um, so therefore, I do have a very early uh, Rivian, okay. the R1T. It puts a big, goofy smile on my face every time I get in it. Uh, zero to 100 kilometers in three seconds. Okay. I don't know whether you've driven a car with that kind of acceleration, but... Okay, yeah, not yet. it puts a big smile on your not face. Yet. It's ridiculous. You don't need to do this. Nobody needs this. <laughs> But, uh, and I wish him the best, and I think he will succeed, but I believe he will always be a niche mm -hmm. producer. Okay. He's producing now a pickup truck that's not actually a pickup truck, mm -hmm. and he's got an SUV that's not actually an SUV. It's different. It's a different way to think about it, and he's not looking for a massive audience. Mm -hmm. He's looking for enough people to uh, cover his scale economies. And so he's looking to make uh, a couple of million vehicles, not 20 million or 50 million like Tesla. And he'll be having uh, more products. There are two more that are on the way that, again, are not quite what you would expect. And so that's always his strategy to be a little different mm -hmm. and to develop a, uh, a brand that, uh, for whatever reason, appeals uh, to a, a group of people. And would you say, are those two companies lean companies? Well, that's a very interesting question. It was certainly my intent to help uh, Rivian uh, be lean. And when you think about Toyota, mm -hmm. they started in 1935. They only got their system perfected by the mid-1960s. It took them 30 years of experiments. Uh, they've struggled across the world to maintain the standard as they've grown. Mm -hmm. Toyota this year will probably sell about 11 million vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, they've struggled to maintain their standards while growing at that rate. It's just really hard to take a brand new company that needs to go fast to hit the market in time and create at the same time a Toyota enterprise with a Rivian product. Okay. And so uh, RJ, he's a wonderful guy, one of the smartest people I've ever met and a very good guy said, hey, I've got to get to market quickly because this fad craze over electric vehicles, you know how the stock market is so That's emotional. True. I've got to get there while the market's hot. And he did a perfect job. November of last year, he goes public. In the space of a nanosecond, he raises $13 billion in cash, which makes it possible to him now to grow pretty quickly but also creates the need now to actually create a Toyota yep. behind the Rivian brand. And so uh, that, I hope, will happen. I wish it had happened now. Wish in the last three years. Uh, but there was this need to go fast. And I say to anybody, uh, you can go fast to go slow in developing a new business, or you can go slow to go fast. What you probably can't do is go fast to go fast. Because uh, what's happened, look, Tesla, they went zooming off and then just had terrible production problems for a couple of years. And Rivian goes zooming off, and they're now uh, in what Musk would call production hell. Okay. Uh, they'll get out of it. Sure. But uh, if there had been enough time, they could have avoided that. But as they viewed uh, the situation, there wasn't enough time. We have to go now. So they had produced a real production vehicle by the time they sold the stock. And RJ said, I have to have the real vehicle. This is not some mock-up. It has to be a real vehicle. 
but uh, there was a lot of uh, rework in that vehicle. Okay. But it was a real vehicle. Okay, I've driven it. Yeah, it's, so. it's a real vehicle. Okay. And it was and, on the market. And the vehicle that I've got, which is number 1467 in the production sequence, uh, has fewer problems than that first vehicle. It's a real vehicle. It's not a Toyota just yet. Okay, but they'll get there. I'm going to help. Nice. So uh, I'm not uh, giving up on that, but I've just had to be a little bit more relaxed than I would like about how good you can be, how quickly. It does make me appreciate, by the way, how hard <laughs> this Toyota stuff is to do in real life. Great. I, I think this is a good point to, to stop this yeah, conversation. Great. It was a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I know that you are traveling uh, mm -hmm. around the Europe, uh, and I really hope that you might take some time and uh, yeah. visit us in Croatia, okay, well. do the real uh, Gemba We Gemba should talk box. about that. Uh, by the way, my condition on going to any country, whether to talk to students or whether to talk to managers, is that I have to first go see what you do. And I don't mean months in advance, but uh, here, uh, I haven't been in Hungary in, in nine years. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, I spent four hours at one company and took a walk in the morning and four hours at another company. And the first company, I don't have the data, but I believe this is probably the best manufacturing company in Hungary mm -hmm. because it's very good, quite surprisingly good. Okay. And the other company's on the way. But that, for the audience that I've been um, uh, meeting with, uh, now I know something. And I know a couple of things. I know they can do this. Okay, okay that's really important because a lot of people don't believe that. So I got up in the meeting. I said, hey, look, you can do this in this country. You can be Toyota. Look, I didn't say you can be better than Toyota. I just said you can be Toyota. And I also uh, know how hard you've had to work to do that and how this takes a long time and how you really have to stick with it. You know, it's what uh, Dr. Deming called constancy of purpose, that the senior management has to have constant purpose and not be shifting all the time and say, we're going to create a lean enterprise and it will take us 10 years, but we're going to do it. Well, any management anywhere, that's unusual. Uh, remember, Toyota's management is completely continuous. There's never been an outsider as a manager at Toyota. They grew them from, you know, 18 or 22 years old. That takes time. So, uh, hey, uh, Croatia, I haven't visited since 1969 on my motorcycle back in okay. my uh, youth. Um, I'd love to come sometime. Great. But I've got to so see something. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, by the way, you don't uh, just want to show the worst thing or the best thing. Uh, hey, why don't we take a look at both? Great. And then you see kind of where you stand. Yeah, I have some companies in mind, yeah. and uh, okay. I hope that uh, you you will have a chance and uh, take yeah. some time to visit us okay. in Croatia, and then we could walk uh, yeah. walk the Gemba. Yeah. We'll, thank, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, thanks you one, once again hey, for this you. great conversation. Thank you. Great fun. Yeah. Back uh, thank you once again uh, for uh, watching our Industry Talks podcast. We do this uh, to promote the importance of uh, high-value-added uh, uh, manufacturing industry. And uh, yeah, stick with us. Uh, we are preparing some uh, new interviews. See you.